Hi everyone, welcome to the first ever episode of the Economic Forces Podcast. I'm Brian Albrecht of Kennesaw State, and I'm joined by Josh Hendrickson, who's at Ole Miss. This podcast is going to be a supplement to our weekly newsletter, which you can find at pricetheory.substack.com. In both the newsletter and the podcast, we focus on basic economics, in particular what people call price theory. For those of you who don't quite know what that means, the newsletter will give you a good sense of the topics and the approach that we focus on. Without further ado, let's get into into today's interview. Who's lucky enough to be our first guest, Josh? Uh, today's guest is Lawrence H. White. Larry is a professor of economics at George Mason, and he specializes in the theory and history of uh, banking and money. Um, and he's probably best known for his work on free banking. Uh, Larry did his PhD at uh, UCLA, and that's kind of what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about uh, Larry's time at UCLA and sort of working in the UCLA tradition and uh, UCLA price theory and how his experience kind of uh, influenced his work and sort of things like that. So before we uh, get into like the weeds of the matter, like how did you end up at UCLA? Was that sort of where you wanted to go all along or... Well, thanks for the invitation. Um, I have to say I'm a kind of an odd choice because I didn't do a lot of price theory. I did more monetary theory. Uh, so at UCLA, I mean, price theory was the term. It wasn't microeconomics. And monetary theory was the term. It wasn't macroeconomics. Um, How did I end up at UCLA? Uh, combination of things. It was the best school that offered me money. Uh, but the reason it was in my application set to begin with was a couple of things. One, I was steered there by an undergraduate professor named Rachel McCulloch. Uh, so I was an undergraduate at Harvard and UCLA was about 180 degrees from Harvard when it came to the approach to microeconomics and to macroeconomics uh, especially. Uh, but Rachel's degree was from the University of Chicago and her husband at the time was Hugh McCulloch, who uh, some uh, of us undergraduates had brought over to teach a sophomore tutorial because there weren't any free market economists on the Harvard faculty uh, who could do it. <laughs> and that's what we wanted. Uh, so she advised me that uh, UCLA would be a comfortable environment for me. Uh, I remember she said, the, the faculty are all crazy, but they're your kind of crazy. <laughs> uh, UCLA was the only school where uh, a member of the faculty called me to try to get me to come. Uh, that was Michael Darby. And one of the things he told me as, as a draw was, we have more members of the Mont Pelerin Society than any other economics faculty in the United States. So they knew where I was coming from. Uh, the other people who steered me there were uh, Jerry O'Driscoll and Jack Hyde. So I was already interested in Austrian economics. And I'd gone to a couple of conferences on Austrian economics, uh, one in 1975, which was between my sophomore and junior years of college. Uh, I met Jerry and Jack. Jerry had just written a dissertation on Hayek under Axel Landhofer at UCLA. So he was encouraging. And the, the fact that he could write a dissertation on Hayek at UCLA was encouraging. Uh, Jack was writing a dissertation on market adjustment. I don't recall who his advisor was. But uh, I knew that writing in, on that kind of topic was also a possibility. And I was interested in that topic. So I knew there were two, at least two strong fields uh, that I was interested in, uh, monetary economics and industrial organization. Uh, and as I said, UCLA was the best program that offered me money. I got admitted to some other programs. I don't know if I need to name them, uh, that offered me admission, but no money. Another program offered me more money, but it wasn't as good a program. A couple of top programs offered me admission, but no money. And I wasn't sure I would find anybody there who would sympathetically advise the kind of dissertation. I thought I would want to write. Um, so UCLA it was, even though I accepted before I'd ever been to the campus. I didn't fly out to see it or anything like that. Uh, 
I was assured that it was a pleasant place to live. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, at the time that you started the PhD, who were the big faculty that everyone was gravitating towards as graduate students because they were kind of doing the pressing research and who were kind of just the big names that everyone looked up to at the time? So my years were 1977 to 81. Uh, and during that period, in my experience at least, the most important faculty were Armin Alshin, Harold Demsetz, Jack Hirschleifer in micro, Axel Lanhuford and Bob Clower in monetary theory, uh, and Thomas Sowell. Uh, Ed Lemer was important in the econometric sequence, but I didn't take that field, so I really didn't have any contact with him. I also took courses with Ben Klein and Earl Thompson, and both of them had some ideas that were of interest, but they weren't working on them at the time. Uh, Klein wasn't teaching in the money sequence, although he had this famous paper on the competitive supply of money. And Thompson was an interesting character. He was idiosyncratic uh, in a way that really didn't align with my interests, let me put it that way. Although <laughs> years later, I went to a UCLA reception at the AEA meetings, and he was the only faculty member from my era who was at the reception. So I ended up talking with him <laughs> uh, and we got along fine. Uh, who else was there? Uh, Finus Welsh was an important labor economist, but I wasn't that interested in labor economics. Uh, he was important in other people's careers. Bill Allen, Alshin's co-author, was there. Uh, in fact, I TA'd for him, and he was briefly on my dissertation committee, but he didn't teach PhD courses. Uh, a name you don't often hear uh, is Clay LaForce. Clay LaForce was the chairman of the department uh, at least until 1980. I think he's kind of an unsung hero in that he raised a lot of the money that made it possible for UCLA to hire and retain the famous faculty. But he also didn't teach grad courses. I tried to recruit him to be on my dissertation committee because he was an economic historian uh, and he had written about the Suffolk banking system. But at that time he had moved over to become Dean of the business school, so he was too busy. Um, there were a couple of postdocs while I was there who are worth mentioning, uh, who are l both later became famous, Larry Kotlikoff and Alan Stockman. Uh, and I had some contact with them. And John McCall was there, but I didn't really have any contact with him. So that's who I would list. So I think you have referred to this before as sort of like the glory years of UCLA. And yeah, so what, I did an interview with Bill Allen and we had some disagreement about when those years were, but from my perspective, uh, they were underway when I arrived and the department sort of began to lose its character. Uh, one, I think when LaForce moved over to the business school and took a lot of his uh, funding with him, I think the coalition that was governing the department uh, started to have less uh, consensus. Uh, this is just my own reconstruction. I don't have any archival evidence of this. Uh, but then the other important thing was when Alshin stopped teaching uh, first year micro courses. And I think that took place in 82 or 83. And then it became less distinctive. So speaking of the famous first year micro with Alchin, could you talk a little bit about the first and second year courses, how they're set up, and then delve a little bit into you know, the price theory course in particular? Okay. Um, so the first year micro sequence was Alchin. We, we were on a quarter system, so there were three courses. Uh, Alchin, Finus Welsh, and Jack Hirschleifer. Uh, the macro sequence was Mike Darby and Axel Lanhoover. That was just two courses. And then there was a quantitative methods sequence. And I don't remember who taught the first two courses. Michael and Trilligator taught the third course. Uh, 
So Alshin's uh, version of price theory, he, he assigned a textbook that's not very well known by someone named H.A. John Green. I don't know if you've heard of it, uh, but it covered most, the, the text and the course covered mostly consumer optimization. So indifference curves, income and substitution effects. And there was a special UCLA version attributed to Ron Heiner uh, of, of the Slutsky equation. Uh, so Alshin mostly taught that, uh, but with frequent digressions into whatever else he wanted to talk about. Uh, so one day he came in and talked about his why money article, <laughs> which was totally off the topic. Uh, but he conducted the course like a law school professor in that he called on students and put them on the spot, asked them to explain the material that we were supposed to have read for that class session. Uh, he taught an hour a day, five days a week, uh, which was unusual. Uh, he taught it with a kind of, I don't know, bemused attitude. I mean, he always had a smile on his face, but he, even while he was grilling a student and putting them on the spot. Uh, and this was regarded as entertainment by some second and third year students. They would come at least in the first couple of weeks of this quarter and sit in the back of the class <laughs> to watch Alshin <laughs> roast the first year students. And I remember one uh, or Socratic dialogue. And it, of course, if you know, so if you actually read so Plato's Socratic dialogues, you know that it's not an even handed discussion. Socrates has all the answers and he's putting everybody else on the spot and making fun of their answers. Uh, Alshin asks to the class in general, what is an economic good? Can somebody define that for me? What makes something an economic good? And I had read Menger, so I raised my hand. I said, well, an economic good is something that satisfies a want. And Alshin immediately shuddered and said, satisfies a want? I play golf every week. I never come away satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> was, there a, was there ever an answer to these uh, big questions? Roughly, to that question, roughly the answer was, surprised me it was kind of behavioral he said it's an economic good if you see people trading some of it for two things are economic goods if you see people trading some of one for some of the other uh, how do you know they're trading unless you are attributing some motive to them to their to their behavior so uh yes sometimes there were answers uh and then the exam questions were often things that we hadn't memorized it wasn't anything that was in the text but it was asking us to apply what we had learned in ways that took some thinking about so one time well, i remember one question very well it was use an edgeworth bowley box to show how the indifference curves would have to look for it to be true that there are no income effects of wealth on demand as required by the coast theorem And I figured out that the indifference curves had to be parallel nested. I would not have. But I, I didn't have them parallel nested on the same axis, on the same dimension. I had one this way and the other that way, which is wrong. But it was a good question. I think uh, Walter Williams used to tell the story about how Alshin would ask a question. And and so like he would he would call on uh on him to answer it and then after the class uh he'd go up to Alshin and he would say okay so what was the answer and he would say i don't know that's why i asked it so is that very common in that in that course some, yes yes some of the questions were like that too uh, yeah i can't think of an example of that but sure they were i don't know not really rhetorical but unsolved questions that you should go home and if you can figure out an answer, write a paper. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, I don't know if you want to hear about the other courses in the sequence. Uh, Finus Welsh's course uh, was basically theory of the firm. Uh, didn't leave a great impression on me. There was a lot of matrix algebra. And one of my classmates was had been a math major as an undergraduate. And he kept whispering, 
Uh, this is such an old-fashioned way to derive these conditions, <laughs> which didn't help. <laughs> but uh, Welsh was uh, in a wheelchair, and so he had limited reach on the blackboard. And as I recall, he would write out a line of equations and then go back to the beginning and erase that one as he wrote the next line. So you had to write your notes fast uh, in that class. Now, Hirschleifer's course was on interest in capital, and it was great. And I teach from his textbook when I teach first year macro now, uh, teach the theory of interest in capital. And it was the first course in which we actually solved for prices, because <laughs> Alshin and Welsh had both taken prices as given, and then we discuss optimization against given prices. But in Hirschleifer's class, we had little models and solved for the market clearing price. So that was very helpful. So that's a good segue a little bit into that middle ground between kind of the micro approach you know, and into more of your research on, on monetary economics, you know, Hirschleifer being one connecting point. Of course, Elchin wrote on why money, as you mentioned, uh, can you talk a little bit more about Leyenhoofed and Clower and kind of the, the macroeconomic courses and then into y your time, you know, doing independent research? What was the unique approach there? How did they kind of lead you? Did they have any interest in, in free banking or just allow you to do what you wanted? A little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, the irony, maybe it's not an irony, but uh, something that people sometimes ask me about is, um, what influence did Ben Klein's paper on the competitive supply of money have on my research? And the answer is not much. He wasn't teaching that. Uh, I did have an IO course from him, but he was teaching his paper on the quantity guaranteeing price, which is a little bit related to the money paper uh, and the stuff he's done on uh, vertical integration as a solution to hold up problems. Uh, so no, Leyenhoofed was not, uh, didn't know anything about free banking, <laughs> who did? Uh, <laughs> but in the money sequence, uh, he kind of taught it a different, his course a different way than usual. He said, I'm tired of teaching about invariance propositions and models in which money is so neutral that it doesn't matter. Uh, so let's go back and talk about the literature where people assumed that money did matter and the institutions for supplying money did matter. So we read the literature on the bullionist debate and on the currency and banking school debate. Uh, and about half the course was students presenting their term papers. Uh, so I wrote my term paper on free banking in Scotland because it was something I had seen a reference to, but hadn't had a chance to really dig into it to do any research on it. Uh, so I wrote a paper and it got to be pretty, a pretty long paper by the time I turned it in. Um, and Axel was very receptive. He said it was interesting. Uh, he said, there, I think there's more here that you can expand on. So that became my dissertation topic. And before that point, I wasn't sure whether I was gonna write in money or in IO, but this sort of enabled me to talk about institutions. And in a sense, what I try to do in the theory part of that dissertation is provide a theory of the firm approach to the way banks operate uh, when they're competing in the issue of banknotes. So there, there had already there was already a literature on treating banks as optimizing firms, but nobody had talked about banks issuing uh, currency in, in that kind of framework. Um, so that became my dissertation topic, um, and so you could say Axel was very tolerant <laughs> uh, and sort of let me. I mean, he asked, he said, "Look, you need to deal with this question if you're going to make this claim," and. He gave me feedback, useful feedback like that, but he didn't tell me this is a topic that's a waste of time or anything like that. 
it seems to me, maybe I'm wrong in this, but it kind of seems to me that, you know, even though price theory gets kind of the UCLA price theory is kind of like the brand, it also seems like they have a brand of macro that um, was also distinct. And I think, you know, you, for example, have written your book, you know, on the theory of monetary institutions. And I kind of think that one of the things that separated um, like UCLA macro, but it kind of relates to their approach to price theory anyway, was kind of like this focus on things like institutions, because I think that's where a lot of this transaction cost stuff and micro led to focus on institutions on that side. But I think the macro people actually um, tended to focus a lot more on institutions uh, or at least it seems to me. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, not everybody uh, teaching money in macro was on exactly the same page. So the first course in macro, in the first year macro sequence was Michael Darby, and that was basically Friedman and Schwartz. Uh, and so, but not, not all that heavy on institutional analysis, um, all about adjustment paths um, of money and velocity and although he called it fluidity uh, and real income and so on. So transitory ver uh, disturbances versus long run effects. Uh, but Leyenhofen and Clower were doing something different and they were influenced and I, by Alshin and I think Alshin was influenced by them uh, and in particular, Alshin's work on the search theory of unemployment. And as I mentioned, John McCall was at UCLA and he was famous for the search theory of unemployment. Uh, and there was the famous Phelps volume uh, that Alshin contributed to. And so that together with what Leyenhofen and Clower did together about there being a problem of coordination failures uh, if prices are not clearing all markets, if people are liquidity strained, uh, constrained, and because the price level is not adjusting rapidly enough, uh, that sort of thing I think was distinctive uh, to UCLA. And something that a lot of people haven't seen, but which is worth digging up if you want a snapshot of what it would look like to write a textbook based on the UCLA approach uh, is Charles Baird's book called Elements of Macroeconomics. So Baird had been a, an assistant professor at UCLA. He had arrived not really knowing Leyenhofer and Clower's work, but got blown away by it and tried to systematize it into a textbook. Uh, it was published in 77, I think. So that's that's what I see as the tradition in uh, in money and macro in, in unemployment, for example. Uh, the emphasis on institutions was certainly there in the course that uh, Axel taught uh, in the money sequence. And other than Ben Klein's work on the competitive supply of money, um, there wasn't a lot of research on the history of monetary institutions or the theory of banking that I kind of had to do myself. So talking a little bit more, kind of jumping ahead in, in time here, but talking you know, on the theory of monetary institutions. In 1999, you come out with, uh, should we call it a textbook, uh, a graduate book, whatever it is, the theory of monetary institutions. Uh, could you talk a little bit about kind of what you saw that book contributing and in particular, you know, how it maybe ties back to some of the themes we've been talking about from the UCLA school? Okay. Um, when I was using that book in a PhD course at the University of Georgia, uh, where I taught from, when was it, 88 to 2000, uh, I once told the class, well, this textbook is kind of written at the level of a master's class. So it's too hard for undergraduates, but it's probably too easy for PhD students. And 
this student at Georgia said, well, then it's perfect for us. <laughs> uh, so I guess the connection is that this I, the idea uh, is certainly in the air at UCLA uh, and coming mostly from Alshin about providing economic inst explanations of institutions. So it's not institutional in the old sense of studying institutions in minute detail uh, the way the old institutionalist school did. Um, and I love Kosa's uh, remark about that way of approaching things. He said they, they produced a tall stack of studies, case studies, looking for a theory uh, or a fire. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't heard that one. Uh, but yeah, the emphasis was on trying to explain uh, institutions. Uh, so Alshin's trying to explain why we see unemployed resources uh, as part of an, a, a well-adjusted system, even in a well-adjusted system. He would say, hotels are not 100% booked every night. So should we regard that as wasteful or what's the reason that they're keeping uh, empty rooms most of the time? Of course, in his course, Alshin talked a lot about price discrimination. So partly the answer used to be that it was harder to price discriminate. Hot wire makes it easier to price discriminate. So we should expect the higher, vac uh, higher occupancy rates. Um, yeah, but in, in the book, I wanted to talk about alternative monetary institutions, uh, how money emerges. Uh, there was a, a junior faculty at uh, UCLA. I don't think he lasted long after I arrived named Robert Jones, who had written a book on, not a book, sorry, had written an article on the emergence of money, which was very Mengarian, although Jack High had to tell him that it was very Mengarian. He hadn't read Menger. So it's got like an independent discovery of the idea uh, that from transaction costs in barter, we get indirect exchange as a coping mechanism. Uh, and then from in indirect exchange, we get convergence on a common medium of exchange. So that's in my book, uh, how a gold standard works, um, how a free banking system works. So that part was based on my dissertation. Um, how central banks have come on the scene and what difference they make. Uh, and then some of the book is talking about other people's theories of how central banks operate based on giving them different assumed uh, objectives. What are they trying to maximize? You can assume different things about what central bank is trying to maximize and get is it seniorage? Is it the survival of the incumbent in office? Uh, and, and get different theories. Uh, and then the last part of the book is about alternative uh, monetary arrangements. So there I talk about Ben Klein's model of privately issued irredeemable money and the Black Fama Hall literature and the legal restrictions theory of money that some people you may be familiar with uh, have written about. Um, I think the, I think I should say this, the most UCLA-ish thing I've written is uh, more, even more than that book is an article uh, that I co-authored with Don Boudreau entitled, Is Non-Price Competition in Currency Inefficient? Uh, so Boudreau had written a paper about how in the industrial organization literature, there are a lot of economists who think if you're not competing on price, then you're wasting resources. And currency to me was a clear example of something where it's hard to compete on price because competing on price means paying interest. And it's in inconvenient to try to collect interest on circulating currency. Well, inconvenient to pay it if you're the bank and inconvenient to collect it if you're the customer, right? How is the currency supposed to keep circulating at face value while interest is somehow accruing on it? Those seem to be inconsistent. That's really interesting. Uh, uh, and so, so, anyway, so anyway, in a situation where yeah. it's 
costly to deliver price competition, our argument was non-price competition is the efficient way to go. It gives customers more of what they want, given the cost of delivering it. This is the type of thing that if, if this was really professional, we would have this in show notes or something, but I don't know how to do that yet. So we'll see if that <laughs> shows up, but maybe it'll be in the show notes, how that works. Yeah. Well, I think, well, I think though this, this is kind of, I think it, um, some of this gets back to sort of what was distinctive about UCLA anyway, because you had people like Alshin, who everybody would identify as like a micro person, writing about things like unemployment. And you had people like, you know, Ben Klein, who's not really a macroeconomist, writing about the competitive supply of money. And you, you just had all of these people who kind of um, were just writing about things that people, you know, that there were, there were sort of outstanding questions that lots of people were interested in and it wasn't sort of like oh well that's for the macro people or something like that i mean everybody kind right. of um contributed to this i mean i think like you know alshin wrote about money klein wrote about that's money right. thompson wrote about money like but these weren't necessarily any of their you know specializations they just kind of applied their own kind of unique brand um and their own kind of insights from their own like work outside of these things to um, to things like money, which I think is also kind of unique because it's especially today, cause you don't see that today. Like everybody's hyper specialized today. Yeah. There wasn't any sense that you weren't allowed to cross these field boundaries. You weren't allowed to write outside your specialty. And I thought that was great. So yeah, the, it was very much in the UCLA spirit to hire the best available people, regardless of what field they were in. Um, uh, and then they could write. It, it, on on what they wanted to write about and they weren't required to stay in a certain field because we hired you to be in this field and we can't promote you if you're not in this field anymore which i've seen at some other schools uh, there was none of that at ucla is there a sense in which um so the you know you you started out the conversation by all oh, those weirdos at UCLA, uh, right? Those self, it was recognized by the Harvard faculty that the, uh, that the UCLA crowd was doing something different. And I've read different articles, both from about UCLA and about Chicago of this recognition that we're doing something different. Uh, was there any sense of that, in the, that uh, we're not, you know, we're not, doing what everyone else calls macro. We're not doing big econometric models or something like that. So these kind of these categories are a little bit weird for us anyways. Yeah, I think there was a, an awareness, a self-consciousness even about that. And there was an effort to hire people who would continue that tradition. Although of course it, it eventually ended uh, and the department today is not that distinctive. Uh, I mean, good people, but not that distinctive, much closer to MIT than it was 40 years ago. Uh, but those g people in that, of that kind were hard to find because <laughs> other departments weren't producing so many of them. Um, so, so you're also coming, you know, the PhD in the late seventies, early eighties. Um, in addition to the UCLA school, you know, there's new stuff coming out of Minnesota, Chicago, you know, kind of more quintessential freshwater macro. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the perception both during your PhD, but then coming out and getting into the macro monetary field doing research of there's this thing going on that's different than us. How do we fit with it? How do we respond to it? I think people were pretty much doing their own thing. Um, so at least in my macro sequence and monetary theory sequence, we weren't reading all the most recent articles in the AER and JPE, uh, some of them, but uh, there wasn't so much a concern with hiring somebody who's up to the uh, 
technical frontier and having them teach for a few years and then replacing them with somebody fresher mm -hmm. uh, the way there is at some schools. So, like I said, uh, Axel's monetary theory course was very much old literature. And so uh, I wasn't really as well trained to read the newest stuff as I might have been. And Axel's macro course was mostly about Marshall versus Valra. It was based on a series of lectures he developed. He was uh, working on a book that was going to be entitled From Maximization to Marshall. Uh, so we learned different equilibrium concepts, and that was certainly useful, but not always so useful for reading the latest stuff. And Earl Thompson uh, taught the other money course, taught his own models. That was all he taught. <laughs> so, but what this did train me to do, uh, this is a story you may not have heard before. Uh, Tom Sargent came to UCLA to give one of his, uh, to the real bills versus the quantity theory paper that uh, he and Wallace were working on. And Axel had me sit down with Tom Sargent and try to explain to Sargent what the real bills doctrine really was. <laughs> <laughs> because as David Lader, Laidler later pointed out in print, it, it's something different from what uh, Sargent and Wallace called the real bills doctrine. <laughs> so that was the training I had. Uh, but when Wallace published his paper on uh, the legal restrictions theory of the demand for money. Um, I had some historical background for saying that uh, I don't think you can explain why currency doesn't pay interest just by appealing to legal restrictions because I've studied a case where there were no such legal restrictions and yet banknotes still didn't pay interest. So maybe we want to admit some transaction costs into the story, which Wallace did not want to do. He wanted, uh, there's an old paper by Wallace and Bryant where they say, all this ad hockery about transaction costs, it hasn't yielded anything useful. So let's just go with uh, strict finance assumptions, perfect arbitrage, no transaction costs. So what's left to explain why currency is dominated in rate of return, it must be legal restrictions. So that's what we're going to assert. Oh, so I, I got a publication by criticizing that. <laughs> and and that's an enemy. Great and, and an enemy in Neil Wallace, cool. but <laughs> Josh, so, you wanna take uh, Yeah, so I guess like um a little bit. But so I guess that was like one of the things that was kind of distinctive. Um, I guess was kind of this, so something that's distinctive in your own work, right, is this focus on, well, like, let's actually look at the history, right? Like, let's, so, um, like, we can write down a model that kind of explains these things, but, you know, like, we have a whole bunch of uh, historical experience and that we can kind of lean on. Um, yeah, no, to, I, and, and I give great credit to the Rational Expectations Revolution for making that kind of research more respectable. Right, the idea of comparing alternative regimes was not really on the table until uh, rational expectations forced us to talk about it. Right, it matters what kind of world people live in and what kind of world they think they're living in, with regard to institutional arrangements and legal restrictions and so on. Can you say a little bit more about the connection? Does that's not that wasn't obvious to me at all. The connection between rational expectations and the more institutional historical approach. Well, this is a, a story that's told by Friedman and Schwartz in their paper on does government have a role in monetary uh, institutions? Is that the title? Uh, in money, sorry. Does government have a role in money? Um, they say, why are people now questioning government's role in money? when they didn't used to, they just took it for granted and you know, tried to find the optimal monetary policy, assuming all the institutions we've got. 
and they said, well, we think uh, in part it's due to a revived interest in Austrian economics and Hayek's work, and in part we think it's due to the rational expectations revolution, where this idea of talking about a monetary regime as something contingent, and we can talk, we can get interesting evidence by looking at how different regimes work differently. Uh, and when we, we can't, of course, the Lucas critique applies, we can't study a rule change and pretend that the old regime still prevails because people should adjust their expectations and behavior to the new regime. So you're right, from, it, from that, from rational expectations, you don't get uh, marching orders to go study historical banking institutions. But there is a resemble, there is a connection um, from, from the question about what government should be doing uh, and what difference it makes what government does in terms of monetary policy. So Sargent and Wallace's work on real bills, so-called real bills versus the quantity theory is in that spirit. Although, as you say, sense. it's theoretical rather than historical. Well, that actually circles back to something I wanted to talk to you about because you mentioned uh, you mentioned Hayek before. So, what um, what was kind of the general attitude um, towards Hayek's work and things like that at UCLA at the time? Well, Hayek himself was. Uh, very much respected. So many members of the Mont Pelerin Society in the department, <laughs> of course. Uh, Hayek visited UCLA, in fact, while I was a grad student. He had been uh, hired, I guess you could say. He was being paid lots of money to speak at, I think, what were gold conferences in California. And he had these two conferences he was gonna speak at a week apart. Uh, in the LA area so he asked if he could have an office at UCLA for the week and so they gave him an office and I got to be Hayek's chauffeur for a couple of days <laughs> uh, I drove him out to Claremont to talk to a guy named Arthur Kemp who was a member of the Mont Pelerin Society but taught money and banking at uh, what was then called uh, Claremont Men's College it's now Claremont McKenna College and there are a fair number of UCLA people teaching at Claremont. Um, I remember trying to get Hayek to talk about free banking, but uh, his hearing wasn't that good. And since I was in the front seat and he was in the back seat, it, it didn't really work <laughs> on the drive out to Claremont. Uh, so there was, there was great respect for Hayek. Uh, Demsets had Hayek on his reading list. Uh, Leyenhoofed was certainly familiar with Hayek. So two stories I can tell. Uh, one is in Leyenhoofed's uh, first year macro course, he'd been talking about Valrasian equilibrium and Marshallian equilibrium. So I was in a study group and we were trying to think of questions he might ask. And somebody said, well, he's probably gonna ask us about these two equilibrium concepts. And I said, well, there's a third equilibrium concept you should be familiar with, which is Hayek's idea that an equilibrium through time means a consistency of plans with of people's various plans so that what other people do does not upset your own plan and vice versa. And everybody said, well, we never heard of that. And I said, well, okay. I mean, just, just as a, by just as a additional piece of information that might be useful. And it turned out, without my foreknowledge, Leyenhoof had asked a question on an exam. Here's what Hayek says about equilibrium. <laughs> what do you think about that in terms of what we've been discussing? So I became an instant hero to my study group because uh, I had <laughs> helped them a little bit prepare for it. Uh, other story is that uh, there was a Austrian economics conference in the summer of 1977 that I participated in as a student and Jack High participated in. And I designed a t-shirt for the group that said Austrian Economics Conference, Menlo Park, 
and then had a picture of the Hayekian triangles in the middle from prices and production. And Jack High was wearing this T-shirt while he was in Axel Leyenhoofd's office uh, talking to him about something. And Benjamin Klein barges into the office to ask Axel something. And he sees Jack High's T-shirt and says, Austrian economics, and there's a diagram? I thought you Austrians <laughs> didn't believe in math or diagrams. And Axel says to Ben, Ben, come on. Everybody should know this diagram. You should be able to look at this diagram and tell me what the average period of production is. <laughs> and Klein apparently was grumpy about this and stomped out of the office. <laughs> Well, that, so not everybody, nice not everybody at UCLA was uh, enthusiastic about Hayek or Austrian economics. Uh, Klein was pretty much straight Chicago thinking. Uh, but did I already say this? Uh, Demsetz had Hayek on his reading list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I guess the, um, the one thing I wanted to follow up on that about is... Um, You know, I mean, one of the things that Hayek is kind of most known for is this idea about sort of uh, his paper, The Use of Knowledge in Society. And, uh, right. you know, Thomas Sowell has this uh, book, Knowledge and Decisions, which is kind of like, um, you know, just uh, exploring this idea sort of, I guess, in much more depth, I guess you would say. And so, you know, you kind of mentioned Sowell, but maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, Sowell and then, you know, uh, that maybe that book, if you want to talk about it or, or not. Yeah, uh, I had the, I don't know if it's good fortune, but I had the experience of being Sol's uh, teaching assistant one quarter when he taught history of economic thought. And Sol did not suffer fools gladly. So I got chewed out when I didn't do things right. Uh, one time I forgot to alphabetize the exams that I had graded before I gave them back. But he taught a very good course. Uh, I taught, I, sorry, I took the last course he taught at UCLA, which was a graduate course in history of economic thought. And it was a very well, brilliantly even organized course in that it wasn't taught the lazy way of let's read some Smith and then let's read some Ricardo and then let's read some Marshall. It was rather let's talk about diminishing returns and let's read five classical economists talking about diminishing returns. And let's talk about monopoly and let's read five economists talk about monopoly and see how the idea has evolved over time and so on for 10 weeks, 10 topics. And that was important to me in the way I organized my book, The Clash of Economic Ideas. I organized it by topics rather than chronologically because you do it chronologically, you keep dropping and picking back up uh, substantive topics. Seems to me less awkward to scramble the chronology uh, if you need to, but go through the development of economic thinking about a particular topic so people can get a sense of the continuity and how economists build on each other and contradict each other. Uh, so that was the only graduate course Seoul taught while I was there. And I think I was, there were only two of us who took it. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of reading, but he also taught it like a law professor. Once he determined that you had done the reading, he left you alone and badgered the other student. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Knowledge and Decisions, yeah, is a, is a great book, which is basically elaborating with lots of illustrations the message of the use of knowledge in society and uh, the idea that knowledge is decentralized and the market makes use of knowledge more than any central planner could because it gives people an incentive and an opportunity to take advantage of particular knowledge they have about what's uh, things on the spot things in their particular area, right? How to grow the crop they're growing in the soil that they actually have with the weather they actually face. Um, and 
they respond to changes in conditions in ways that they couldn't possibly have written down in advance and given to some central planner. Um, so Sol was very keen on that idea and uh, I think he did a, a great job turning it into a book. Uh, and of course it's all through Sol's other writings, the idea that uh, it's foolish to turn things over to so-called experts who only know a tiny fraction of what all the practitioners in the field know. It's a kind of pretense of knowledge, as Hayek later called it. Mm -hmm. Well, the conversation uh, on... Sorry, let me, let me just add this point. I, I'm sure you've seen the uh, short book on uh, the UCLA school in the Essential Economists series that the Fraser Institute is publishing. And my one criticism of that volume, which is by co-authored by David Henderson, who I almost overlapped with at UCLA. He had finished just a year or two before I began, but he was friends uh, with somebody who lived in my same apartment complex uh, across the street from campus. So I saw a bit of David even when I was a graduate student. Anyway, so it's a great book in other respects, but I really wish they had written more about Seoul, and especially in the chapter on the economics of discrimination. Absolutely. And interesting that you know, Seoul was there, Buchanan, too, for a, a short year. Yeah, before my time. Kind of, yeah. Big names that aren't necessarily always associated with uh, UCLA, but obviously there's some overlap or wouldn't have been brought in. Uh, the conversation on, on Seoul and Hayek brings up something I was meaning to ask you about. And you talked about how you came from uh, a little bit of an Austrian background, and then you went to NYU and more again in that in that Austrian uh, milieu there. I wonder if you could talk just briefly about kind of the what you see as kind of differences and, and similarities between uh, the Austrian school, especially you know, coming out of the 70s into the 80s, you know, what was on people's minds at NYU and the UCLA school? Well, I think, uh, so Kirzner is the big leader of the Austrian group at NYU, uh, famous for his work on entrepreneurship. And that's what Demsetz had on his reading list. And I think it was, the, the respect was reciprocated. Kirzner, uh, was, uh, what's the word I want to use, not fond of, but <laughs> uh, was favorably impressed with the work that Demsetz and Alshin were doing. Uh, and their willingness to talk about how markets adjust uh, out of equilibrium. So not trying to shoehorn everything into an equilibrium always uh, approach. Uh, so some Austrians are want to differentiate what they're doing from neoclassical economics, but my attitude has been that it's a branch of neoclassical economics, and so there's certainly possibilities for cross fertilization. Uh, there may be different questions that different schools of thought, the, the Austrians are asking that UCLA people were not asking and vice versa, but it doesn't mean they're incompatible. So it seems to me there, there's a, a lot of complementarity between the two. And in monetary theory, I think there's some complementarity between what Leyenhofen and Clara were doing. Uh, Richard Ebeling has written about this and and what Hayek and other Austrians were doing in, in business cycle theory. Uh, after the financial crisis, Leonhoof had wrote, the uh, 2008 or 2009, Leonhoof had wrote a paper in which he had a section on how a Hayekian would look at the burst of the credit bubble and relating that to Hayek's theory, which is all about over investment cycles. Uh, Although he didn't embrace that as you know, a complete explanation, and talked about what other schools of thought can also contribute to our understanding. 
Well, I think there is that uh, kind of complementarity. Uh, if you're open to it, if you really you know, want to insist on strict uh, product differentiation, then you might want to exaggerate the differences. And there are some uh, tensions, I suppose, or some issues where the approach might be a little different. But I think in Herschleifer, uh, demonstrated this too because he had those papers sort of on like what in the world is Bob Bobber talking about kind well, of Well that's thing. right yeah. and then that's part of why I, he's on my <laughs> macro reading list uh, he's he puts Bob Bobber in a larger perspective of different approaches to different neoclassical approaches uh, to interest theory and how can we understand the equilibrium concept, the intertemporal equilibrium that Bombaveric is uh, grappling toward, and how is it different from what Frank Knight was saying and what Irving Fisher was saying, which I think is very useful, and the students should know all three models. Well, one final question uh, on the idea of product differentiation. I mean, you brought up trying to conf push a differentiation between the Austrians and UCLA. Some are trying to do that. Um, seems to me that there's I mean, under differentiation today. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about any ideas you have on how we could encourage more differentiation amongst economists or amongst departments, you know, and, and on what margin we could ever try to recreate at a smaller scale, you know, what happened at UCLA of, of kind of really fruitful differentiation? Well, I, a few years ago, actually 10 years ago now, uh, interviewed Bill Allen about a piece he had written for Econ Journal Watch about the UCLA department. And he talked about this and uh, mentioned a paper, a, a document, like a memo, I guess, written by Ed Lemer, which surprised me because I hadn't thought of Lemer as being part of the uh, sort of Alshin crowd, but in which Lemer said, look, uh, we're kind of a, you know, marginal at the bottom of the top 10, or maybe at the, in the second 10 uh, economics department, we can't cover everything. What we're known for is Alshin type price theory, uh, property rights, that sort of thing. And what uh, Leyenhoven and Clower are doing, we shouldn't try to do everything. Uh, if we try to do everything, we'll just be a pale imitation of other departments. And I think that's right. I'm glad I was there when it was still a different kind of a place uh, with the collection of people that they did have. I think that's a lot of the spirit that animates George Mason, if I can toot my current department's horn. Uh, we're trying to hire interesting people, uh, people who are doing something that, that doesn't really matter what field they're in at the time. We can always rearrange people to teach undergraduate courses. Uh, and we can adjust our graduate offerings based on what people are doing because the students should study with people teaching what they're working on rather than people teaching other people's work because it's not their field. Um, so I think departments have to sort of have that willingness to stick out a little, uh, to be distinctive. And as far as, I mean, one thing departments are concerned about is with placing their graduate students. And I don't think it's hurt uh, you GMU graduates. I think it's helped them uh, get get placements, not at the top 10 departments, um, but at the kind of liberal arts teaching institutions they mostly want to teach at. Uh, some, of course, have gone to research intensive institutions, R1 institutions. Uh, an interesting case is David Scarbeck, who isn't teaching, a, a recently got tenure at Brown University, not in economics, but in political science because he wrote his dissertation on the economic organization of prisons and has continued to do interesting 
work in that area uh, on sort of governance systems. So uh, Pete Betke likes to describe uh, George Mason as combining the best of Austrian economics, public choice, and the new institutional economics, which covers UCLA approach, Coase, and the Ostroms. And so Scarbeck's dissertation is very much in that third uh, tradition. But we're not trying to do everything. Uh, and I think more departments should try to do that. So we have some now some sort of GMU uh, outposts. When I was at UCLA, we used to talk about being a University of Chicago outpost. Uh, we had a, a graduate student softball team in an intramural league, and we called the team the Chicago Farm Team. <laughs> uh, so there are some GMU outposts now. Texas Tech, uh, for example, has hired good people and is turning out uh, good PhD students. Well, I want to thank Larry for joining us today, our first episode of the Economic Forces podcast. Uh, we're going to try to do these recordings, these interviews every month or so as a supplement, as I said, to our newsletter at pricetheory.substack.com. So thanks again, Larry. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. <laughs>